where you are um, traveling, um, you can always just call in on the phone and listen in. You won't have the same, you'll be able to see everyone's beautiful faces, but you'll still certainly be able to participate. Uh, okay. In addition, we will be, re I'll record every lesson. Um, once we had an error with the recording, most of the time the recordings go through properly and we'll be able to um, send them out afterwards. So if there's a class that you have to miss because, because life happens, you're all certainly aware how life um, happens. Uh, feel free not to stress out. We'll always record them. Um, and uh, though, even though this medium is has its limitations, um, on the one hand, we're not in the same room together. On the other hand, it certainly has its connections where we have people sitting in California and Atlanta and Dallas. Um, College Station and learning together and Karen's on the phone. Um, so we have that amazing opportunity. And I do know this was competition. This class was competition for people who did have Super Bowl plans. Um, and I guess I'm so like, aside from making sure everyone has Super Bowl food, I'm not such a massive Super Bowl, uh, I'm not a massive football fan. And so I made sure everyone's taken care of. And then I said, okay, see you guys later. Um, so <laughs> I hope this convenience is okay. Um, and I hope we're going to be able to learn together. So um, we actually piloted this last year. Um, <laughs> and I know that Pam and Leo, who are on here, were participating in the first class. Um, and we had a really, really nice opportunity to learn together. And it was really, really a treat for me. So I'm hoping that it could be the same for everyone who's on here, uh, that it could be enjoyable and uplifting and eye-opening and just an opportunity to connect on a different level. Um, and so I'm really glad everyone's here. But what I was hoping is maybe um, we can just take like two minutes, you know, a minute each person or whatever, a few seconds each person just to introduce themselves, where they live, um, you know, what are they interested hopefully in gaining from this class or what we're going to be able to study together. Um, and then we'll jump right in. Um, we did also, just as like a, I guess, business, get the business out of the way, the technical stuff out of the way. Um, obviously the class will be recorded. That'll be sent out afterwards. If there is a last minute cancellation, because life is unpredictable sometimes for me as well, um, I will just notify you. Um, and, uh, by email. And um, one other thing is if you have any questions or any follow-ups, feel free to message me. Um, and if you know anyone else who you feel, any other Jewish Aggie moms that will enjoy this, they can log in at a different time. Um, they could join. It's not too late once the link is sent out. So if you feel like this is something that you know someone will benefit or enjoy, um, and I will definitely try to respect your time and be there on time and end on time. And even if we take this into May or June, I'm okay. I have you know, it's fine. We'll, we'll, so we cover the course, but this way we'll begin and end on time. Cause I remember last year, the classes did go on a little bit long sometimes. So we're going to really try to keep to the time and respect everyone's very, very busy schedules. Okay. So I'm Anya, I live in college station. I'm passionate about, um, learning Torah, teaching Torah. And I think we have access to information nowadays that we have not had 50 years ago, 20 years ago, even. And I find it, um, inspiring and uplifting to learn together with fellow Jewish women. Um, and so thank you for joining me on this incredible adventure. So Pam, since you're next in my queue, you're next. Just introduce yourself where you're from a little bit about what you're hoping to enjoy or benefit. And I'm going to meet myself, so it's better. I'm from Atlanta, Georgia. I have a um, final year student at Texas A&M named Josh Williams, and uh, we've enjoyed our participation with Texas A&M. And I'm looking forward to studying this. I don't know much about Tanya. So thank you. Connie, your turn. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, I'm Connie Rico. My daughter is Sarah Rico. She's also, um, I think she's a junior now. 
in uh, in Texas uh, and Texas A and M, and she's been joined your classes and all that. Uh, I'm a mother of three. Sarah is my second daughter. Um, I I had a couple of you know my other uh, son might go to Texas A and M, so he might be one of yours. <laughs> student soon um he's gonna be transferring over there hopefully soon uh, my oldest son he's already graduate he's an engineer uh, i am a lactation consultant i work in a methodist hospital i live here in dallas and um and my husband also you know um he's uh, working also for the city of dallas as a sanitary Leora, you're next. Okay. Hi, I'm Leora Lewis, and I have a daughter, Talia Lewis, in her third year at, at uh, the university. And I have two other kids in the C teen. Well, one they just every everybody has finished like the C teen network and then gone on to college. So I have uh, a freshman in college and a junior in high school. And I'm looking forward to learning Tanya and gaining more insight into how Tanya works with Judaism, how, how we can learn more and uh, gain more spiritually. Awesome. Thank you, Leora. Um, Susan, you're next. Um, my name is Susan Mandel. Um, I actually got my uh, undergrad degree from Texas A&M. I have a son who's a uh, sophomore at A&M right now studying computer science, and I have a second son who's a uh, sophomore in high school. Um, I'm a pediatrician, I do urgent care medicine, and um, I'm looking forward to kind of doing this class online because I can actually, you know, do it when I have on my schedule and meet a lot, of, meet some other women, um, you know, and, and just learn some more um, about Judaism. And I've got both my dogs here <laughs> with me. <laughs> We welcome dogs. We welcome dogs. <laughs> We're very friendly. <laughs> okay, Karen, you're up next. Okay. I have no idea how this works. Can you hear me? We can. We can. And Karen, okay. you can log in on the phone or in the future if you want to log in on the video, you can enable okay. video as well. Whatever works. Okay. I'm okay. on my phone, so I'm actually in bed, I'm in bed sick. So that's why I was like, I've got the phone here with me. We're happy you um, joined us. <laughs> Don't worry. <laughs> so, that's okay. So I'm Karen Van Crabelt. I live in Dallas, Texas. I am a mother of four. My oldest daughter, Erin, graduated from a and I guess, a year ago already. Um, best school ever. We love a and We love Manya. She's the best. And her holds a special place in our hearts. So when Erin told me there was this class, she said, Mom, sign up. I said, okay. I don't even have a clue what it's about. But I did as I was told. So... <laughs> Well, um, we've also, Erin uh, was also the president of Chabad and she was, she's, we love her and my kids love her and it's great to be learning together. Um, you know, Karen's like, is it, can Aggie moms who kids graduated take it? I'm like, you're always part of the Aggie family. <laughs> That's the beautiful thing about the Aggie family. It just, it grows. And, uh, and, and Connie will look forward to having, I'm not sure what your son's name is, join the Aggie family as well. Um, okay. So. Here's, here's where it's going to be interesting is that um, we have some people on the phone and in the future who are going to be on the phone with us and on the computer with us who this is their first class. And so while I would say, let's say the class we did last year was a great launch of an overview and perspective and those who want to go back and do it again, oh, we're always open to doing that and we will do that happily. Um, I always feel like this is the next step of learning, but um, because this actually happens to be probably my favorite um, subject to learn and to teach and to explore together with people. Because um, if I have to think of the thing that probably is most, without me even realizing it growing up, had the most impact on my mindset, my perspective, um, it, it was Tanya. And as a matter of fact, um, for Pam and Leora, you met Allison last year. And Allison will be joining us, just not this class. So Allison once asked like, how do you guys do what you do and how you do it? Like, is it the training? Like, what is it? Like, how do you guys, you know, 24 seven, whatever it is, it, you know? And I said to her, it's all Tanya. So it's really nice actually becoming full circle many years later to actually be having opportunity to study it and explore it. 
Um, I will say as um, a shlucha of the Rebbe, this has been the most impact in my life. As a, you know, as a Rebbetzin, as a mother, this has been probably the work of, the work in Torah that has affected my life the most. I would say even something that I try to work on as far as my character is concerned and my children and raising them, definitely the biggest influence has been Tanya. So for me, it's a merit and an honor to be able to explore it together, some of the themes and some of the ideas in Tanya. And what I'm hoping today, um, what we'll accomplish today is at least um, framing why this is the fundamentals and where it comes from. And also, um, in addition, kind of before we get to Tanya, what is Tanya? Like um, I think Pam mentioned, like, I don't even know what this is, but I'm, you know, I'm here. I think that was, you mentioned it. Um, and, 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 and then from there kind of opening up and I don't, I don't anticipate we're going to cover the first chapter because some of it's kind of more of a framework and an introduction. Um, and, and, um, and kind of like just understanding what it is we're about, the journey we're about to take really. So first and foremost, um, the book of Tanya has actually three names. And the, the, the book of Tanya is actually, before we get into the three names, is actually what I would describe if someone asked me, what is Tanya? I would say it's Kabbalah applied or applied Kabbalah. What, so, okay, that's great, but what's Kabbalah, right? It's great to say this is applied Kabbalah. This is Kabbalah that you can apply to your life. Sorry about that. But what, the reflection on the glass is making me nervous. Um, but what actually is Kabbalah? So you, Kabbalah has a lot of myths and a lot of names. And if you Google Kabbalah, you can end up at some Kabbalah center buying water and red strings for a lot of money. Um, there are large Kabbalah centers in California and a lot of stars go because their life isn't working and they need something holy and something clarifying. Kabbalah can mean a lot of things for a lot of people. But authentic Kabbalah, the word, and this is something you'll see recurring in whenever you're studying Torah, is to understand what something is, you need to get to the root word. So what's the root word for Kabbalah? Or, and I know Madonna studied Kabbalah for a while, and Britney Spears studied Kabbalah for a while, people, people have dabbled with Kabbalah. So Kabbalah in essence means received, right? Kibel means, in anyone who knows a little bit about the Hebrew language, Mikabel or Kibel means to receive. So what is this, a Kabbalah applied, received, applied, like, what am I, what are you saying? So what is Kabbalah? Kabbalah is a work of Jewish mysticism with depths and layers to understanding the secrets or the reasons, the deeper truth kind of in everything. So you can do the Kabbalah of human humanity. You could do the Kabbalah of Torah. You could be, do the, study the Kabbalah of the world. What I want to do is before we understand Kabbalah, um, before we jump into Tanya, I want to take a deep, a little bit of a deviation. It's not in your books because this is kind of more an intro introduction that I've put together over the years when jumping into this course. And I realized we jump headfirst into the course, right? But like, wait, I don't know how to tread water or I, I, I don't even know the language that you're saying or, or the vocabulary or the nuances. So step one is, have you heard of the word Kabbalah? Like, what does it mean to you? Anyone here heard what Kabbalah is or isn't? Anyone? I've kind of heard it in connection like with what you were saying with Madonna and a lot of the stars in the LA Center and things like that. It was trending. I mean, for a while, Kabbalah was quite trendy, uh, even though it's Jewish mysticism that's secrets and, 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 you know, was always studied by inner circles. Kabbalah was definitely, definitely trending. So Kabbalah means receiving um, and it's receiving, it's received teachings from the beginning of time. So Kabbalah is a part of Torah and it's a part of Judaism and it's really the deeper truth to everything and really the soul of everything, right? So a soul is not visible, it's not tangible, but it's a soul, um, a soul is in essence a part. So um, basically, it, 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 the Midrash actually describes when Abraham discovered God, Abraham went to study and he went to study Yeshiva. You're like, wait, he was the first Jew who discovered God. Where is he studying? It was always since Adam until... Noah, and then Noah until Abraham, onward and forward, there was always an elite group of people who received teacher to student, teacher to student, the deeper, more mystical layers of learning the, re the, thing, the behind the scenes, the behind, um, behind 
the layers that you see. Because in essence, the Torah really is written in text, in code, I mean, right? When you press a button on your computer, enter, yeah, you're pressing a button saying enter, but really, I have a lot of computer science students, they spent hours coding, right? Writing code, so that when you press that enter button, the enter button actually does something. It's not the button that's doing anything, it's written in an abridged code. Um, same thing with our cell phones, we press a button and it's written in code. So at the end of the day, the Kabbalah, to understand the Kabbalah, layers of Kabbalah, we're going to first understand kind of a little bit how this idea of Kabbalah, the lens of seeing the deeper things behind everything, applies to Kabbalah, the Kabbalah of the world, and, and then the Kabbalah of Torah, and then we'll jump into Tanya itself. So as far as the world is concerned, we all live in this world, right? And um, I was just speaking to someone about, you know, the universe and understanding the, the map, the incredible, like, wonders of the fact that we're in this world, yet how um, small this world is. Um, and she was actually a fellow rabbit, and she called, she said, I'm still teaching the Tanya course. And I'm not sure how to explain the idea that like on the one hand, we're so significant and so important, but on the other hand, we're so insignificant and import, unimportant. Like they seem totally different. So I said, okay, number one, we have to establish the fact that paradoxes exist. And paradoxes are very much a part of life and a part of Torah and anyone who, you know, we're adults who are living life, you understand the paradoxes can coexist, right? It's sometimes you know, male and female, the fact that they can build a life together, that's pretty paradoxical. Like what? <laughs> they think differently, they feel differently. How do we build? It's a paradox. So the idea being is understanding that on the one hand, this universe is so big and magnificent. On the other hand, if you can go and Google it, I remember it popped up on my Facebook feed a while ago, and it was about how small the world is how really insignificant it compared to all the planets and all the universes. It was, I think, produced maybe by NASA to show like how incredible the planets and the, it zooms out and shows like, at the end of the day, when you see the world compared to all the rest of the planets in the universe and the Milky Way and all these things, it's like, we're literally a dot on the map. And yet this dot on the map is so incredibly significant to God and to, to existence. So at the end of the day, when we look at the Kabbalah of the world, how did God create the world? Anyone know the narrative? We just looked at it. Uh, we just were talking about it, the narrative of how God created the world. Anyone know study Genesis at all? Feel free to jump in. I get sick of my voice. <laughs> so God created the world through speech. God created the world through speech. He said, let there be light, and there was light, and let there be, and let there be dark light and darkness and day and night and people. Did God, like, if I had to create, you know, okay, I have a beautiful glass vase here, so I have to create, I wanted to create this. I'm not, I'm not creating anything, don't worry. But let's say this was my job. What would I have to do? I would have to take raw material. I would have to, let's say I'm creating a bookcase or, or, a, or a chair. I would have to take the wood, take the tree, take the wood, cut it, carve it, create it. I will step away from the, when I step away from my bookcase or my table, the table still exists, right? However, Kabbalah actually explains that God actually created the world through an eternal everlasting speech. What does that mean? If we believe, according to Judaism, that God is eternal, that his speech is also eternal. So it's that basically in, in uh, that he, God actually has a different relationship with the world than we have with anything else we can create. Okay. So the, I, I remember once we were discussing creation. Uh, no, we weren't discussing creation. It was bedtime in our house and I was laying with one of my children and um, this child philosophy 101 happens at bedtime always. It's like, you know, instead of talking about the weather or sports, we discuss, he, he, he likes the big ideas. And so he says to me, mommy, when did God create the world? I'm like, what do you mean when you? No, no, no. He says, how long did it take God to create the world? And I was like, what do you mean how long? You just learned Genesis. You just learned the six days of creation. God created the world in six days. He created it through speech. He says, no, 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 mommy. He's like, well, this is, I'm not getting it. He's like, how long did it take? I'm like, what do you mean six days? No, he's like, okay, no, mommy. How long was it till God decided, I want a world? I want people. So we believe, according to Jewish mysticism, according to Kabbalah, that God, an eternal God, at one point woke up and said, I desire a relationship with mankind. And so God created a world. 
So according to Kabbalah, the whole creation of this entire world and the universe and everything that happens in it was actually based on a desire. Now, I tried to explain to my son basically time before time. Because how do you explain to a seven-year-old or six-year-old at the time that one day, that before God said day and night, day one, day and night, day two, time didn't exist in the same construct. The construct of time only started at a certain point. Once God said, here's day one, here's day two, here's light, here's day, here's dark, here's et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So the idea is that why was, do the Kabbalists say it was a desire? Because at the end of the day, a desire is inexpl inexplicable. So for instance, what's your favorite flavor? I don't know. What's your favorite fruit? Anyone? Persimmons. <laughs> Why do you like persimmons? They taste delicious. They taste delicious. And I bet if you ask someone else, they'll be like, oh, persimmons is the only fruit I can't touch, right? You can't explain why. If you ask someone, you're a chocolate or vanilla? So you like cinnamon or you like chocolate? Chocolate. Why do I like chocolate? Because it's delicious. Why is it delicious? Because I like the way it tastes. Can you explain why? So it's this, the Kabbalah actually says a desire you cannot explain why. And actually in Talmud it says, with taste and flavor, you can't taste um, tam and smell. Things that people like or dislike, you can't explain why one perfume smells amazing to someone and one perfume is like, oh, terrible, right? It's, it's something that either I desire or I don't desire. So really in essence, God's creation of this world was based on God's desire to engage in a deep and meaningful relationship with us. Finite, imperfect, complicated humans. And later as we go into time, yeah, we'll understand a little bit of some of those tools that Kabbalah gives us in order to help us navigate the complexity of being finite humans, okay? with a little bit of an infinite soul, which we'll talk about soon, and how we handle that friction and that complexity of those two, again, paradoxes. Because at the end of the day, God created the world with Dibor. Now, what's fascinating about creation through speech, something that you and I cannot do. Now, yes, as parents, you know, you can tell your child something, okay? You're, like you can try to create a reality with words for your child. A child that's raised in a home with positivity and encouragement and warmth and love, even verbally, what we say to a child makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. We could even think of the child within who someone said something to us 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, and that may rise to the surface because we can understand that speech can create a certain reality but we can't create matter through speech. Interestingly enough, when a magician does a trick, what do they say? Abracadabra. That actually comes from Aramaic. Abira Kadibor, I create with speech. That's oh. where abracadabra comes from. They're creating. It comes from the idea that God created the universe through speech. Now, I don't think most magicians are conscious and aware of that, but at the end of the day, there's a source to understand that speech creates a certain reality. Now, God created this universe that we live in, ex nihilo, something from nothing, which again is something that's out of our capacity. We don't understand. If I throw this pen up in the air, it's going to come back down. Why is it coming down? Well, we have laws of gravity, of course. And what else? Why else can it stay up? Well, it has a matter, it has a weight, and of course, for the gravity. There's gravity, there's weight, and the energy that I propel it up with can only get it a certain distance before the gravity pulls it back down. Now, if I do it with more force, yes, it may hit my ceiling and it may take longer to get down and I even make a mark on my ceiling, but it will still, it's still returning. So for us, our relationship with the world, with life, with things is very finite and limited. I cannot throw this up and it stays forever. So it's really, really complex to understand an infinite God or an infinite a relationship with infinite speech. Again, very hard to comprehend. But what we do know is that if we want to understand something, 
we have to look at the Torah. So the Torah actually says, Hamechadesh betuvo bekol yom tamid ma'asev reshit, which means God actually recreates the world every single day. That means that the initial speech energy that God invested in matter, which we'll talk about again, that will come up a little bit later, is actually still being streamed into existence in 2020. So there is a perspective that God created this big, magnificent world, set it sailing into the universe, and was like, peace out, good luck, have fun. I'm going to sit front row, eat popcorn, and see what kind of mess you guys make. That's a relief. I'm removed from, God is removed from the world. Judaism says, absolutely not. There's a God that's invested and involved in every single day, every single idea, every single moment behind the scenes in a concealed way. And according to Kabbalah, God intentionally, again, we'll talk about why later, intentionally created this world with his divine presence concealed. And the answer, the reason why, which again, we'll get into later how this has practical implication for our life, is in order to allow you and I to have free will, to succeed, to fail, to live, not to overwhelm, be overwhelmed by divine energy, to be human. So God actually created through a process in Kabbalah discusses as simtsum, or contractions, contracted his relation, his identity with this basic world, concealed his, his identity in order to make space for you and I to have something called bechira, which is free will. So what does this mean for us? Okay, and this, now, by the way, I'm literally touching the very, very surface of the Kabbalah of this world, just to give you an idea of how Kabbalah would look at things in a different light than other perspectives or lenses to see things through. How does this apply to our world? So there's a beautiful story of the Baal Shem Tov was once explaining to his student a concept called Hashgacha Pratit, which literally means divine providence. That means that my day-to-day -day life, God's involved in. He's aware, he's involved, he didn't, again, press the start button and step away and see you later, peace out. God actually is involved in day-to-day -day workings of my life. So he was discussing this concept to his students and his student was walking and his student was really struggling with it. Like, how is it that God is really cares about me and my life and what's going on? And so the Baal Shem Tov said, take a look, look at the ground. Look at the ground. So the student says, you're telling me that the leaf that's on the ground, God cares about, God has something to do with it. The Baal Shem Tov said, lift, lift up the leaf. And some of you may have heard the story lifted up the leaf and there's a little worm there. So the, the student says, okay, fine. There's a worm under a leaf, like very nice. So, so let me actually tell you what happened. This little worm was trudging along in the heat and it was hot and it was uncomfortable. And he said, oh, master of the universe. Remember to a worm, God is his God, his master. I'm so hot. I'm so tired. Please like cut me some slack. Help me out here. And so the Baal Shem Tov says, God went to the angel of wind and said to the wind, I need you to blow in this direction. And then to the angel of the tree and said, dear tree, I need you and your energy. And I'm not saying angel of the tree, but the energy, the divine energy within the tree, within matter. I need you to sway. And that little leaf, the branch should shake. The little leaf fell down to cover that beautiful worm so the worm could take a nice little nap. So while it's a beautiful story, there are moments in our lives where we could see the Shem's hand in our life, and there are moments in our lives where we're like, really, are you here? Like, are you sure you didn't forget about me? Are you sure you didn't forget well, what's going on in our house or our, in our life? Like, help, SOS. But we understand through the lens of Kabbalah that this relationship that God has with this world didn't stop after creation. And therefore, what that leads us with is trying to understand, okay, that's wonderful. You created this big universe. You created me in this universe. I, why am I here? And if I know why I'm here, how do I navigate it? How do I navigate the ups and downs, the challenges, the chaos of day-to-day -day life? Because last night, um, I, my sister-in-law had her 50th birthday for bringing in gathering in Houston. And so Shabbat was over at about 
6.40, and by the time I was able to leave Chabad, because there is a whole crew that hangs out all you know, Friday night and Saturday and Shabbat day and Saturday night, and thank God, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's not, not, not quiet, which is exactly, exactly how we want it. Um, and so I left Chabad at around seven. I ran to the house, put on like a little bit of makeup because I was like still asleep, made a nice coffee and jumped in the car to drive. And um, my sister-in-law asked a question, which I think was a very deep and beautiful question. She said, how has life changed from 50 years ago, let's say our grandmothers or 100 years ago, our grandmothers' lives? And it was such a beautiful question because the answers were so varying. I mean, first of all, 50 years ago, we could never sit together and do this from different locations. Like how amazing the amazing times we're living in, right? And so it was a large group of women, um, really ranging in age from, there were for sure women in their mid 80s or early 90s, and there were women in their teenage years. It was a, quite a robust, diverse group. And so it was actually cool to see the perspective of different women. One was like, oh, washing machine. One of the ladies like, hey, I remember when my parents got the first washing machine. I was 14. Um, so it was, it was a really diverse group. And um, one of the conclusions were that as much as things have changed and evolved to incredible, I mean, from science to technology, I mean, you can, you can track your child's phone to know that they're safe. I mean, literally. Parents used to ship their kid off at 14, 15, you know, away out of the shtetl or out of the town or to someone hoping on a train. And maybe six months later, a year later, they'd get a letter back, right? We're living in miraculous times. You can FaceTime and say modani with your child. I know uh, there are parents who were able to light the menorah together, their child in College Station, their, them in wherever, you know, wherever they were. How beautiful. But the other hand, we've never been more, and this is another kind of layer that came up, we've never been more pulled in so many directions. And I think as women, it's probably, uh, with all the advantages we have now, you know, one woman said, I can own a business. A hundred years ago, my grandmother couldn't own a business. You know, that's tremendous, miraculous, incredible. But the other hand, we are never been more divided and tugged in so many directions with so much chaos and so many to do's and, and I bet each one in our own way can very much relate to this. Like the idea of truly being present and focused and, 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 you know, not worrying about 10 different things that is going on is, is a challenge, but we need to dial it back to remember that exactly who we are, where we are in this world at this time is exactly where God put us for a very unique reason, and through the lens of Kabbalah, as pulled and, and complicated as life is, we can now actually begin to use those tools and wisdom from thousands of years ago to help us navigate this insane arena of 2020, okay? Any thoughts or comments or questions so far? Feel free to jump in. I have a question. Oh, well, no, no question. It's more a comment. Go for it. Uh, I, I with, my children, <laughs> with my children, sometimes it's kind of funny. Um, sometimes they say, Mom, um, we did this like a, a long time ago, this or that, like maybe five years ago. And for them, it's like, oh, mom, it, this happened a long time ago. I was like, no, it's not a long time ago. It's a very short time. No, mom, it was a long time ago. I was like, well... If we compare your 19 years or your 21 years, five years ago was a long time. I'm 55, trust me. Five years ago was just around the corner. <laughs> you know, that's perspective that life gives us, right? I remember once I was driving, and this is years ago, my oldest was maybe seven or eight, six or seven or eight, and we were driving outside the Holland Tunnel, and anyone who knows the tri-state area, because we lived there, for eight years before we moved to College Station. Anyone who's familiar with tri-state area traffic knows what a nightmare it is. And um, I think Dallas traffic comes pretty close. I'm not sure about Atlanta, but for sure LA traffic understands. And I remember when we, we were there, my son said, oh, this is so much traffic. And I said, oh, it's, it's not so much, like it's fine. And then <laughs> later at night, he told me, he said, mommy, today you hurt my feelings. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, you know, what did I do today? You know, what are, what's on the list? And he said, when you told me it was a lot of traffic, maybe it wasn't a lot for you because you lived longer. But for me, it was a lot. 
And by the way, for us, actually to have that understanding of what our kids are living through, because as much as we may feel pulled and tagged, we still understand what it means to be able to be centered and focused. For a lot of our kids, this is their life. And this is tagging and buzzing. Uh. And, I mean, non stopping over a second, they can eat a sandwich without knowing and everyone else knowing what they're eating, right? It, we're, we're living in pretty intense times. So I think even more so than before, these ideas of the Kabbalah has taught us that are thousands of years old will actually become valuable tools. And the truth is, when we leave this course, and this is probably why, why I'm so passionate about it, because for those of you who know me well, know I'm very practical. I like practical. I like implementable. I don't like, I like, I love theory for an idea, but theory that's just theoretical and actually gets me in trouble sometimes for those of you who know me, because I'm always so like driven to practically drive down this abstract idea into reality. So it makes me a little impatient. Like if we're need to redo the kitchen, it needs to be like, how are we doing it? It has to be practical. It has to happen soon. Like sometimes I have to remind myself like everything in every time and slow down and take the, but that's my nature, right? And what I love about this course most is we will leave this course, God willing, with a lot of practical tools to implement into our lives, into our, into our children's lives. Like I said, it's been something that's influenced the way I've parented tremendously. Um, I'm still parenting because thank God I'm very much still in the game. Um, you know, when your oldest is not yet 20 and your youngest are 10, you're still very much in the game. Um, and from what I heard from uh, you wonderful moms out there who have children older, you're never really quite done. That's what I've been told. Pam says, yes, <laughs> you're nodding. You sign up for life, huh? <laughs> you sure do. <laughs> My oldest is 32. <laughs> there you go. So, and I actually have a question. Go for it. Connie's. Uh, the Connie's comment, and that is, I always thought you had to be a certain age to learn Kabbalah, and maybe I think I understand why now, because she recognized and you recognize that we have this wealth of experience behind us at our ages at this point. Okay, I want to answer what you mentioned, because it's a very well-known idea, myth, theory. Okay, for many, many years, the idea, the advice was don't study to Kabbalah till, the, till you were 40. And as a matter of fact, was we'll learn shortly when the Alter Rebbe, how about this, Pam, pause that question. We're going to get to it shortly. I'm going to move into one more explanation of where Kabbalah fits in the history of Torah. And it will still be part of the introduction to understand why in, I'm not yet 40. I will be there in a few months. I'm getting there very, very soon, zooming in on 40, but I'm not yet 40. So how on earth am I not only learning it, but teaching it? Like, really, you're Mama Shapisher. What are you doing? So we'll get to it. I guarantee you I'm not violating any code by teaching, okay? I'll answer. That's a good question. And you're right, and it's a well-known myth, and I've heard it from students saying, wait, you have to be 40 to study Kabbalah. What are we doing here? So if you remember, I also talked about Kabbalah Applied, which goes back to what I was saying is it's practical. Very, very practical takeaways from this course, which hopefully when we leave, we'll be able to see um, the tools that we gain from it. So to where to understand where Kabbalah falls in to Torah, because Torah is like this, and we talked about this last course last year, there is the written Torah, which is the five books, or right from creation till Moses passes, that's the Torah scroll that you find in every synagogue, excuse me, in every temple around the world, the same, that's the Chumash, okay? Then we have Tanakh, which is Torah, Nevi'im, which is prophet, the prophets that are canonized from Joshua till the destruction, till the prophecy of the destruction of the temple of Mashiach, till that era. And then we have Ketuvim, which are literally called writings, and also certain select things like Psalms, like Megillah, the Megillah of Ruth, like the Megillah of Esther, like Shir Hashirim. Those are parts that were also became canonized as a part of what is known as the Tanakh, and that is the full. Torah. When someone says a story from, you know, Daniel and the lion's den, it's part of Torah. When we read Megillah, the Megillah of Esther, it's a part of Torah. It's holiness. We treat it with sanctity. It's written by a scribe the same way a Torah is written by in a holy way. We would, we would, we treat it with reverence. It's not part of the original scroll, but it's canonized as a part of Torah. Psalms also, tremendous power, tremendous, you know, amazing um, energy, divine energy. So that's what Torah is. 
Now within Torah, there's the written Torah and the oral Torah, oral tradition. So the written Torah, as I mentioned, is all those parts that are written. The written Torah, as I said earlier, is written in code. So for instance, if you wanna to try to understand the Torah, if I tell you, and it's very well known in Shema, right? We say, um, you should love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, your mind, Okay, and here's an interesting thing. It's a mitzvah. And these words, that I'm commanding you today, should be in your heart. You should teach it, teach it to your children. Um, and we know when you're home, um, when you go on your way. Okay, so we're talking about belief in a God and loving God and our obligation to educate our children when you wake up, when you go to sleep, when you're at home, when you're traveling, meaning the obligation of being a Jew kind of doesn't go away. It's wherever you are, right? And that is an interesting one. It should be a sign between your eyes. You should write it on your doorposts. Whoa. Okay, what? What am I putting between my eyes? What am I putting on my doorpost? As we talked about last class, that's code. Without the oral tradition, without a teacher to student explaining, which according to Torah, we believe Moses actually on Sinai, what was he doing for 40 days? He was not sipping margaritas. He was actually learning the oral tradition. God was teaching him, when I say you should bind it on your, you should bind it on your arm, I'm actually talking about the tefillin. Who writes it, Phil, and what do they look like? What, how do you write them? What's inside? What materials used? How, sh who, what, when, where, how? That was tr transmitted orally. Because in fact, the Torah was never intended to be studied um, just on your own independently. You were never supposed to just pick up the Torah and read it because it's written in code. You didn't understand it. It was always meant to go hand in hand with the oral tradition. Meaning, when it says you should put it on your arm as a sign in a, between your eyes and your heart, and like right near your heart, um, and you should put it on your doorpost, it's talking about tefillin, it's talking about a mezuzah, it's talking about saying the Shema before when you wake up and when you go to bed. The only way we know that is with the, it being handed down hand in hand with the oral tradition. We believe that the Torah, and we're going to get to where Tanya falls into this whole picture, that the Torah is actually which literally means God's will and God's wisdom. You want to know what God wants out of you. You want to know, you know, when you're, when you're married to someone, thank God for a long time, sometimes you could look at them and you already know what they're thinking. Has that ever happened to you? Or like you're in a situation, you know exactly how they would react or what they think about that situation. That's a beautiful thing. That means you're, you've connected on a deep level for us as Jews. The Torah is actually our deep way to connect to God. If you want to understand what God thinks about things, what God feels about things, and what God wants out of us, it's actually Torah. And we know the word Torah comes from the word, it's not history, because the Torah is not a good history book. If it was a history book, you would say, this is not a very good history book. It's actually a lousy history book. It's missing names and dates, and it's not in chronological order. There's a lot of problems. Where was the editor? There's certain times that are repetitive, right? The Torah comes from the word hora'a, Torah, like mora, right? We all know a mora as a teacher. So the Torah itself was given with layers. The layers, and by the way, if anyone wants, I don't mind typing up an overview of these main points, but we will circle around to them at the beginning of next class before we loop in. Is my, is my, am I getting cut off or is it clear? Because it just said my internet's unstable. It's clear. clear? Okay. So basically, the idea being that according to Torah, to understand, there's the pshat, which is the written, very visible, what you see is what you get. But we're introduced to Abraham, and he's already in his 70s. When we first meet Abraham, is where God's saying, lach lacha, go. Wait, where was he beforehand? We said he's the one who's discovered God. He's the first Jew. He's, what, where does that come from? That is all from the next layer um, there's four layers to understanding Torah. There's Pshat, which is basic text. There's Remez, which is things that is hinted to. And I'll give you an example. There's Drush, which is Madrash, which fills in the gaps, like 
explaining Avram's life until then, which was again, orally transmitted, teacher to student, teacher to student. And then came Sod, which is mysticism. And actually they make up the word pardes, which means a beautiful orchard or a beautiful fruit bearing garden, because there's something at every layer for every single person. Um, and each layer gives us a unique perspective. So for instance, back to the mezuzah or the tefillin, if we look at just the shot, bind it on your eyes and your arms, where, what, when, how, oh, the other layers of Medrash will explain all the details of who, what, when, where, how. Remez, the sign, the layer of sign will tell us what the intention, like what its significance is. So for instance, the fact that there is a shin on, um, there's two shins on a tulin. There's a three letter shin and a, four, a shin with four lines. It's the only time you see a, four, a shin with four lines. That actually is to remind us of the matriarchs and the patriarchs, the avot and Mahot. That's a remez, something that's supposed to remind us of something. And so is the mysticism. What's mysticism of tefillin, let's say, and I, this is not necessarily the most relevant here, but I once had a student who called me, he says, he's very down, he's very stressed, he's very anxious, he's very nervous. And I know this student and we've helped him through everything and he thank God he's seeing a therapist and he's making a lot of progress. And I said, when's the last time you put on tefillin? He says, my emotions, my mind, my, my mind is racing, my emotions are overwhelmed. I can't get my act together. I said, when's the last time you put on tefillin? So he says, Manya, how is tefillin gonna help me with this? And I said, do you know what tefillin's intention is? He said, no, it's a mitzvah. Okay, God wants me to do it. It's a good thing to do. Fine. I said, no, 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 sweetie. Tefillin, you put it on your head over here, the Shema, your arm over here, right near your heart. Tefillin, actually, the mysticism behind tefillin, and obviously this is a very abridged version. Hi. <laughs> the mysticism behind it is to align your intellect, what you're thinking, your heart, what you're feeling, with your arm, that's why the tefillin is right here, and your in actions. So literally, the function of tefillin, and you, guys, you could listen up at least, is to align your intellect, your emotion, and your actions with your potential, with what God wants. So the student looks at me and says, aha, so I really do need to put on tefillin. I said, exactly. But how do we know this? And that comes from mysticism, okay? Another interesting example of remez is if you look at, let's say, tzitzit, my boys walk around with tzitzit, right? Knots and strings. You know, my husband, when the kids used to say, they'd go ice skating and their tzitzit are flying. And I was like, what are those? What are you wearing? My husband said, just tell them it's your Wi-Fi service, you know? <laughs> it's always a joke, you know, obviously it's my tzitzit. But if actually through the lens of remez, what you look and understand is that the tzaddik, yud, tzaddik, yud, and taf, Sadik, there's a whole way of understanding that each new letter in Hebrew has a numerical value. So the Tzadik is 90, the Yud is 10. So like Aleph is one, Bet is two, Gimel is three, etc. The Yud and the Tzadik is another 90, another 10, and the Tuf is 400. So that equals 600. Wonderful. That's nice. Look at the strings and the knots. There's eight strings and five knots. So for a young man, and I'm glad you're here joining us for this, no pressure, when you wear tzitzit, and it says it's supposed to remind you of God, what it's supposed to remind a young man is you have 613 mitzvot, and you, wherever you go, remember them. They're a part of you. So that is something we would only understand through the le lens of remez. And that was only something that's understood the, the in connecting the dots was through mysticism. Now, mysticism, for instance, um, the six days of the week, let's say, seven days of the week represent the sef seven divine energies, which we'll talk about later in the world, okay? We'll understand that a little bit later. Right now, that sounds a little abstract, to say the least. So the idea being that, um, oh, I, I realized I did say, I'll show you in a second. So. To, so the Kabbalah actually connects the dots between the abstract, the, the, code, the Torah written in code, its layers of meaning, and how the Kabbalah would actually apply it to my life. How does it apply to my life? So here, just to show you, and I hope it's going to be clear, 
here's a chart that I wrote when I was trying to do it. Pshat, which is basic text, the surface level. Remez, things that are hinted to. A remez means a hint or a sign. Drush is medrash. It fills in all the gaps between all the details of the stories that we're, we don't really know. It's like I said. And sod means secrets. Could you see this? I'm not sure if you can see. It's a little messy. Um, for next week, I will have a whiteboard so I can actually show you things. Pardes, it stands for Pshat, Remez, Trish, and so. And by the way, even the fact that Pardes stands for these four is actually Remez. Okay? So that being said, moving forward, where does Tanya fit in? Because that's what we said. We're going to go full circle. And next class, we'll jump right into Tanya. Tanya actually fits in to Kabbalah applied. What does Kabbalah applied mean? Like I said, for years, there was always an elite squad or elite group of sages and masters and Kabbalists that studied the mystical secrets behind things. So let's say we know it's a mitzvah to light Shabbat candles. Okay? Wonderful. For thousands of years since Sarah, Jewish women have been lighting Shabbos candles. Okay? It's tradition. We've been doing it for 4,000 years. Yeah? We know the blessing we say, no problem. It's a mitzvah, we say a blessing. The fact that that light that we light, in, in, that with the, the candle that we, um, I can't think of another word but light. The, the candle that we light, we ignite a flame. Mysticism, Kabbalah would teach us that that actually not just only, not only brings a physical light into the world, but it brings also a spiritual light into the world. And that's why there's a beautiful tradition to light one candle for each child. Because in Judaism, we learn that a flame is a reminder of a soul. And each of our children are light and have potential to bring light into the world. And when you on a Friday night light not just a candle for yourself or your spouse, so you light two, but you now actually have the opportunity to light and bring light into the world weekly. That's a reminder of your children's light. That's something that mysticism will teach us to um, give us a depth and a layer of meaning and understanding to this simple mitzvah of candle lighting, okay? which is no simple mitzvah, because mysticism also explains that when we light that candle, since we're tapping into that feminine energy for thousands of years, since Sarah, an unbroken chain, guess what? That's a potent, a spiritually potent moment. That means that behind covered ha eyes for thousands of years, us as Jewish women have been the ones who've had all our prayers and our thoughts and our hopes and our dreams and our wishes for not only just ourselves, for our children, for the world, and brought that physical and spiritual light and warmth into the home. Because guess what? According to Pshat, the reason we light candles, very unromantic, very unspiritual. One reason. In the Code of Jewish Law, it says we light candles. That a person shouldn't trip over a rock in a tree because Shabbat is a day of peace. And if you leave a rock or a twig in the middle of the thing and there's no light lit because you can't light a candle on Shabbat because you can't create because it's a day of rest. Someone's going to trip on the rock and say, who left that rock here? You ever had an argument like that? Who left the shoes here? I just tripped. I just no, no, no. Day of peace. Just light a candle beforehand. So really, according to the basic reason, very, very basic, dry reason for lighting candles. But when we understand the deeper layers of what it accomplishes, and historically that link in that chain, and the light we're bringing into the world is not just physical but spiritual, and it's a reminder to ourselves of the light that our children have and their inner potential. And there may be a week. And don't listen up, young man, but listen here for a second. There are weeks that moms may not think our children are bringing so much light. We know they have a lot of potential light, but we ain't seeing it. It's not so bright right now. Yeah, Leo, you're laughing. Not any of your children, I know. But I may have one. No. <laughs> Sometimes we're not seeing that light. It's a reminder to us as mothers. The light exists. And that we, our job is to help them not just have that light, but share that light. So because of that, we understand the spiritual potency of that moment and the prayers, the, the, the divine blessings and the prayers that that brings into the home of candlelighting. So that's an example of how we learn a very basic mitzvah that seems simple in a deeper way. Now, I want to respect time, and we have three minutes left, and I really want to try to end as close to eight o'clock as possible. But what I wanted to say is 
that Tanya was basically Kabbalah that had to deal with the mind, the soul, and the psyche. And to answer Pam's question earlier is why did we study it? So the Alter Rebbe actually addressed that. Because next class, we'll talk about historically what was going on, some of the complexities of the generation, um, and why the Alter Rebbe felt it was a need to spread these secrets that were only studied by exclusive groups of Kabbalists to the masses. Because in 2020, we can Google Tanya, classes, workshops, books, tons on it. So the Alter Rebbe gave an analogy. And there were actually groups, I just want to say there were groups, and we'll talk more about this next week, there were people that tried to stop the Alter Rebbe what he was doing. Because they said it's blasphemous. You're spreading ideas that are only meant for elite scholars, for an inner circle, for a secret society. What are you doing? You're, you're spreading it out there like nothing. So Alter Rebbe gave an analogy. And I think we'll probably end with this analogy and then questions. The analogy the Alter Rebbe gave was that there was a king, and the king had a kingdom, and he had an only son, and his son was meant to take over the kingship. And his son got ill. And when his son got ill, um, no one could cure his son. They tried from all over, it wasn't possible. Finally, one doctor came and said, I think I have a cure that may help your son. In the crown jewel that you have, there is a mineral. And I think if we grind up the mineral, if we grind up the mineral and one drop enters the mouth of your child, there's a chance we can save your son. And what do you think the king did? Taking the precious stone from the king. It is. No questions asked as a mother, of course. If there's a chance to save a son because the diamond is only a stone, but the child is the continuity of the kingship. Without the kid, there's no, there's no one else. It's over, it's his child. It's a continuity of the whole entire, the stone isn't the dynasty, the stone's just a stone. So on the odd chance that the drop will be ground and diluted, and one drop will enter the child and will save his life, it's worth it to grind the, sun, the stone. And that's, what the, and that's what was done. So the altar Rebbe gave that analogy to explain. He said, until now, the secrets in Kav, 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 of Kabbalah were like that precious stone. Untouchable, only certain people could benefit from it, only certain occasions, no one could touch it, the crown jewel, no one touches it. But the Jewish people at that point, and we'll talk a little bit historically what was going on, where it's such a bad place, spiritually, emotionally, psychologically, historically, that we needed to take these dip, this, this stone, this precious stone, grind it up, dilute it a little, and feed it to the masses. And that's actually why Tanya was, like why the altar explained why Tanya was being not just released, but released to the masses in mass. And we'll talk about it later, a little bit, not later, but next class. So that in essence, to your, to your answer, if you and I opened the book of Kabbalah until Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai in the Roman Empire, no Kabbalah was documented at all. Rabbi Shimon Bar Yechai was lived towards the end of the Roman Empire, the destruction of the Second Temple, realized that where the world was headed and documented the first piece in a book called, very famous, the Zohar, okay, which means light. Zohar, if you and I open Zohar, abstract, written in code beyond code, we would not necessarily be able to have tools taken from Zohar. But actually what Tanya did was give us these tools and in one area, our mind, our soul, our psyche, how we can function to the best potential that we can with tools recognizing human condition, human nature, the challenges that we have, and what we'll see throughout this journey together is that the, that the ideas that the Alter Rebbe teaches are very, very practical, are very, very real, and are very, very like useful to how we can maximize our potential and bring light into the world. Um, and so next class, if you want to read the introduction, feel free. It's in your books. If you want to, 
We'll next week, we're not going to go through those pages. We'll I'll just summarize it briefly and give a drop of historical context as to why at that point in history, in Jewish history, Dr. B felt compelled to document this. Um, because again, even the oral tradition, as we said earlier, wasn't documented until it was like, there's a need, we're going into exile. And that's when the Jerusalem Talmud was written, the Babylonian Talmud was written. It's always taught teacher to student, teacher to student to maintain that human relationship. And then at a certain point, it was like, we got to get this in writing because the masses need this. And so the Alta Rebbe understood that this was the time that the world needed to not hold on its laurels of like, okay, only for over 40 and only for this elite squad of sacred uh, Kabbalists. It's like, no, 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 we need this and we need this now. And when we learn it, we'll see. Um, I was learning this course with professors. I teach on Wednesdays, a women's class. And one of the professors was, as the deeper we got into Tanya, she said, she, said, she was very emotional. She was crying. She says, I wish, I'm in my 50s, I wish I knew that this was part of Judaism. It would have saved me so much aggravation in life. So to me, this is my favorite. Like I said, as I started with, we're back full circle, is my favorite. I love to learn it and I love to teach it. And I'm so glad we're going along for the journey together. And if anyone has any questions or thoughts or ideas, I see someone logged in on a Galaxy tab. Whoever that is, I will be happy to email out the link afterwards. If you want to introduce yourself, we can't see you, but we can hear you. Feel free to jump in. Someone has a tablet. Anyone, whoever's on the tablet, you can unmute yourself. If you're not sure how to, for next week, I'll be able to guide anyone who needs help with the tech end of it. Um, it's only because Naomi on the tablet. I didn't see Eastern time. I messed up. Oh, it's okay. I'm gonna send out the recording and you'll have it. Love you. Thank you. Next week, but I'm gonna I'm gonna send you the recording either way. Okay. Okay. Thank Any, you. Any, um, anyone else want to jump in with any thoughts so far? This is like an introduction to the introduction. Typical <laughs> Jewish situation. <laughs> any thoughts or ideas so far? No? Okay. I hope it was clear. If as you're, um, we go on, any ideas or questions percolate and you're like, wait, wait, what did she mean by that? And I don't understand what she said by that or I don't agree with that. Feel free to either shoot me an email, send me a text. Or write it down and next week we'll pick up the pieces and we'll go further. Okay. Looking very, very forward. Um, we will definitely be in touch and I will be happy to send this out when we're done. And I'm actually impressed. We kind of kept it to an hour. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. It's nice you. to meet everyone. Looking very, very forward. Yeah. Take care. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night, Laila. Bye, Mania. Thank Bye. you. Thank Bye. you. Good night. Good night.